So, yes. Uh, the subject is women and uh, literature and society in the early modern period. And I would like to begin with the uh, evil background going back to uh, the Middle Ages at a time when basically if you were a man, and unless you were very high class, if you were a man, you were probably going to be digging and plowing the land, you are probably going to be planting crops. If you were a woman, you were probably going to be uh, raising children and spinning, spinning wool, flax and hemp into thread to make clothing and blankets. So these pictures of uh, women were the uh, most common depiction of women, all right? If we look at um, these different pictures, there are many pictures of women in this period uh, doing exactly this. They're spinning wool or flax or um, hemp. These are the three main materials that we use. Wool was the very typical one for England because they had a lot of sheep. And, uh, in medieval pictures of the time, that's the thing that women are most commonly doing. Even quite high class women were engaged in doing that work. So that would be very, very typical for women at that time. And not only does the art show women spinning more than anything else, but it also shows them sometimes using the spinning wheel as a weapon. All right? Uh, we've got quite a few examples of that. Women, angry women, okay, uh, using that spinning jenny as a weapon. So it's not a spinning jenny. Technically, it's, a dis it's called a distaff. Um, the, the, the jenny was a more complicated piece of equipment. The, the distaff was the one they used to held in their hands and they used it for spinning the cloth, the, the material, spinning it into uh, yarn so it could then be made into cloth. And, uh, I'd, I'd like to pick on that particular image, the image of women actually kind of taking a, a symbol really of their kind of domestic lives and uh, transforming it into uh, a weapon, all right, of attack, aggression. I'd like to take that because uh, I think it's something that we're going to be coming back to all through this course. We're going to be looking at uh, a particular topic, all right, again and again, and so I want to uh, focus on this image right from the beginning, and of course the topic is women and power, okay? Uh, we're, we're, we're looking here at um, the power that women have within society. We often think that in medieval times women had no power, uh, and there's some truth to the idea that, that women had limited power in those days, but you see, so did most men have very limited power. And uh, we need to think about this in terms of the balance in society between uh, men and women and social class the roles that they had according to their uh, social class. Um, if we take a look at um, the accepted narrative, which is just moving slowly from male hegemony, in other words, male patriarchal society, male control, um, and that the medieval times were a time when women were, were completely kind of subordinate to men, and denied positions of power. And today we have a, a, a more balanced, a more equal kind of society. Women have more chances of occupying positions of power. You have you know, female prime ministers and politicians and heads of companies and professors at universities and all sorts of things, which even 100 years ago were unusual in this world. Uh, so we expect that if you go back five or 600 years, uh, women are going to be in a very, very much weaker position. Well, I'm not saying that that's completely wrong. There's some truth in that. Uh, 
but it, it simplifies things a bit too much. And if we accept it just at face value, we could miss out on some significant aspects of the uh, society in those days. We could uh, get a kind of misunderstanding, really, of just uh, what the dynamic was between the sexes. Uh, the point is that most people had very little control over their lives in those days. It didn't matter whether they were men or women. The men would be pretty much forced to work in the fields, to dig, and to plough, and to harvest, and to sow, and uh, their lives would be uh, basically not under their own control. It's, it's particularly for people living in the countryside, they would have to follow the rhythms of the farming, the agricultural year. And uh, it was a society of hierarchy, strict hierarchy. I mean, that's one of the defining features of medieval society, that it is a hierarchical type of society. Right? If you think about it in Japan, it would be the same sort of thing. Medieval basically means uh, what we call the, 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 the feudal system, uh, where you've got some people at the top who are totally in control, and most of the people are little better than slaves. So whether you're a man or a woman, you were not going to have a particularly um, good life in the sense of having personal freedom or anything like that. So sure, it's true that most women didn't get any education, especially if they were low class. But then most men didn't get any education either. Right? Um, High-class women didn't have any choice over who they married, in general. But neither did high-class men. Right? It's not, it's not as, quite as unbalanced when you think of it like that. It's not quite as unbalanced as we, as we often uh, imagine. So, uh, it's important to look at a narrative of, uh, well, okay, women had hard lives, but what kinds of lives did men have at that time? So, I've said that for most people, it was going to be a pretty tough kind of life, uh, but you had this rigid structure, social structure, and for people living in the towns, there was going to be greater freedom, a certain amount of freedom for people, a bit more flexibility. Um, for people who were involved in the religious life, there were going to be more openings. I mean, the, the religious life had its own strictness, its own discipline. But inside it, women could rise to high positions of power, to be, to be the abbess of a priory, to be the person who is in charge of a, a convent, you know, it's just a doorway, kind of, um, the, the person who's in charge of that would be a powerful position for a woman. Okay? There wouldn't be much doubt about that. Okay? So uh, that, that's the sort of thing that, that we need to... Uh, think about here. Uh, I'll focus to start with on um, the French wife of Edward II. She'd be a pretty good example of uh, a woman who, who stood out, uh, was quite unusual, a very powerful, a very, very powerful woman. She was married to the, the king, Edward II. She was French by birth, but she married the English king. Um, her marriage was starting to fall to pieces, so what did she do? Firstly, she took a lover, quite openly, quite kind of, she took a lover, all right? And this could be a dangerous thing in those days. I mean, in, in the time of Henry VIII, he chopped off the, the heads of two of his wives. This would be later on, okay? But two of his wives had their heads chopped off because he said they had lovers. Um, she took a lover, and not only that, but she and her lover actually took control of the crown. They beat her husband and took control of the country. Okay, there's power for you. Uh, it's also said that possibly she murdered him. He was murdered a year later, and it's possible that, uh, that she was involved in that. Okay, it's not... It's not sure, but there's a suspicion that she was involved in, in the death of her husband. So, uh, 
you know, it, it was a balance of things because later on her son came along and uh, he, uh, he took her property, he took the crown back again and he took all her property. But somehow or other, even then, she managed to negotiate herself back into a position of power and she got her lands and her monies back um, and she died a natural death many years later. She does figure in uh, the movie Braveheart, but I can't recommend Braveheart because it's completely not historical. Okay? Um, it's fun, <laughs> right? uh, but it talks about the young Isabella, but again, it gives the impression of a very powerful woman who is capable of doing, which certainly that much is true. She, she, she had power and she knew how to exist and survive in the world of men, and not just survive, but to, to flourish. All right? So that even in the political scene of those days, there were, there were powerful women. Said it's mostly in the uh, field of literature, uh, uh, sorry, uh, re religious literature, religious life, and, and the literature that came from the religious life uh, that we find women uh, expressing themselves and uh, making a, an impact on the on the culture. Um, Isabella had a, a big library. She was clearly very well educated herself, but. Uh, Obviously, she wasn't living the religious life. And it's inside that religious life that we find the first real uh, women writers in English. So, uh, there was a book written in the, um, well, late 14th century called Revelations of Divine Love by... Uh, Julian of Norwich. When I was a um, when I was a student, they used to call her uh, Juliana of Norwich, but now she seems to be known as Julian of Norwich, which is confusing because Julian is usually a boy's name. But uh, she was a um, a religious writer of the 15th century. She was what was called an anchoress. That's um, a type of hermit. You know, was somebody who, because of religion, decides to live their life alone, away from other people. A, a kind of hermit, an anchorite. Uh, she, she was a female anchorite. And uh, they lived in little cells, like, uh, like this one, attached to the outside of a church. It wasn't always like that. Sometimes it would be a cave somewhere, something like that. But that is a, a surviving anchorite cell on the... Uh, outside of a, a church, still standing in England, and uh, anchorites like Julian of Norwich uh, lived frequently in, in those kinds of places. Doesn't look terribly comfortable or inviting, but it wasn't meant to be. They were supposed to be sacrificing their lives for a spiritual kind of insight, and so they lived a very simple life inside uh, a little cell like that on their own. Uh, when she was 30 years old, this, you know, before she actually became an anchoress, she, uh, she had a severe illness and uh, because of the illness, I think during the time that she had, she probably knew she was having a fever or something, and she, she somehow, in, through her fever, sorry I'll change the colour of that, um, it's, uh, the, because of the uh, religious experience um, coming at the time when she was ill, we can suppose that she had a kind of a fever or something like that, and she, she, she got into a sort of mental state where she was uh, feeling that a, a kind of religious experience, a, a particularly important religious experience, and uh, she wrote it. She wrote it about it at the time, and then uh, about 20 years later, she wrote again about it, kind of analysing what she thought had happened at the time. So it, it's, it's in two steps. This uh, um, revelations of divine love. It's, it's in two steps about her uh, religious experiences. And. Uh, Quite a lot of this sort of, um, yeah, more of 15th, you know, 14th, 15th century sort of religious experience 
was based on um, this kind of what we call mysticism, uh, mystical experience. Um, here we go, mysticism, which was a feeling or perhaps a vision, seeing something extraordinary, a sort of sense of uh, being together with God or experiencing God in some kind of way. So uh, it wasn't usually about religious teaching or um, religious belief. It was usually about that kind of experience of feeling together with God. So that was the kind of thing that, that she would be writing. And then uh, a little bit later in her life, or towards the end of her life, really, she, she met um, a very famous uh, woman called uh, Marjorie Kemp. Sorry, before that, I just put up there her most famous words. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. You see, it's not about religious teaching. It's about a feeling of positive feeling, a feeling that everything's okay, an optimistic sense of hope, uh, because God loves us. That was the kind of message that, uh, that would be typical in the religious writing of that time. A sense of uh, everything's, everything's all right. God's looking after us. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to understand women's writing from this period, you'd probably have to do a little bit of work on the religion as well. Okay, because most of the writing uh, that women did at this time was connected with religion. Uh, yes, so then, as I say, later on she met uh, uh, Marjorie Kemp, who was the author of the first known autobiography. Okay? Autobiography, obviously we think of it as a really important uh, form of uh, writing. And the first autobiography that we have in English was actually written by a woman. And again, it's a, she's, she's writing to a large extent about religious experience, but she's not actually... Um, a religious woman herself. I mean, she's not a, a nun or, you know, uh, any kind of um, you know, formally religious uh, person. She's she's um, she's actually uh, she she was married. She was a businesswoman. She she made religious pilgrimages. You know, you know this idea like the Canterbury Canterbury pilgrims. You know. Going to make a, a journey for God, a little bit like Ohingo sang do in Japan. Okay, that kind of uh, wandering, uh, following a route uh, that's specially kind of got a religious meaning. And uh, she, you know, she, she did this. She went all over Europe, and she, she, she went to uh, Palestine in the Middle East. Okay, the the, the, you know, the the land of Jesus Christ in the Middle East. She even went there, which is a a huge adventure for a woman in those days. Okay? And so she writes a very, very interesting uh, account of, of her travels and her life. So this is a, a very um, significant book from that, from that period, Marjorie Kemp's life. Um, she, she had these mystical experiences. She did all this traveling. She was married. She was a businesswoman. She ran a monk. Of all things, she ran a brewery making beer. Okay, uh, so you can see, you know, she, she 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 was she, she had kind of power. She had influence in, in all sorts of different ways. A brewery and a grain mill. These things, of course, were connected because uh, just as in Japan, you know, rice and sake are connected. Grain and beer were connected. Uh, in, in, of course, in in, uh, in English society. Uh, we're not really sure. There's a lot of debate about whether she could actually read and write herself. Um, it's possible that it was uh, transcribed, that, that she, she spoke it and somebody else wrote it down because she couldn't. But uh, we can put her in the context of other, other writers. Uh, for example, uh, she shows the influence of uh, another uh, woman, not, not an English woman this time, a Swedish woman, uh, Bridget of Sweden, and uh, she shows the influence of her work in her, in her writing. So whether she could read or not, clearly somebody read books to her. 
she couldn't read. Somehow she got access to uh, the writings of other writers. So either she could read uh, herself or um, somebody read it to her. Because we can see the influence of Bridget in her own works. So uh, we can put her in the context of other texts in that way. All right? So um, she would be quite an important kind of background person for the um, idea of women as writers and women producing literature. And this is actually a page of her original manuscript. Okay. Um, this is the surviving manuscript. Of course, there was no print in those days. So any manuscript, any, any written work had to be written up by hand. We don't know who wrote this. This is the surviving version that we have. This is what we've got. All right? Uh, it's, it's probably being copied from a copy from a copy from a copy. Okay? Because they couldn't print books. They didn't have print in those days. So things would be uh, produced in, in that, that, kind of, that kind of way. All right? Okay, well, look, I'll take a short break there. Uh, because that takes us through the medieval period. Um, we'll take a short break and any questions or comments, and then we'll move on to the uh, 16th century. Okay, then. So, uh, the 16th century. Well, the 16th century, the, the early 16th century, is dominated by the great irony of that man that I mentioned earlier on, Henry VIII, who was desperate to have, to have a son. Sorry, I should move this on a little bit. Yeah, we've got, oh, oh, uh, yes. There's something, one or two little details in here to keep you awake. Right, if you look at the end of your prints, at the end of the third page, it asks you um, who wins. There are three of them. There are two more coming up. Okay, so keep your eyes open. All right. Uh, <laughs> well, I set these things up and I don't forget to, <laughs> don't forget to use them properly. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's uh, Julian of Norwich there. Um, you get the first one to bonus. Um, and Marjorie Kemp. Uh, Shown there, sitting and uh, you know with a book, but it is questionable whether she actually herself knew how to read, um, or whether it was read to her. Okay, so let's move on then to the, the the 16th century. As I say, we've got this big irony of this uh, brutal king Henry VIII, who wanted to have uh, a son, and. Uh, First thing he did was he annulled his marriage to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, uh, because she had grown old and she had not given him a son. She, she'd, uh, she'd given him a daughter, Mary, but not a son. Uh, and so he, 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 he left her. Um, pe people frequently say he divorced her, but, but technically he annulled the marriage. In other words, he said the marriage never really was a marriage. All right? The excuse he was using was that she had been married to his brother, to Henry's brother, Arthur, and Arthur had died. And then he married her. And the Bible says, you must not marry your brother's wife. So you must, you must not lie with your brother's wife. The Pope disagreed. The Pope said, uh, it's only if the brother's alive that you can't do that. Once he's dead, it's okay. And because of this disagreement, uh, England uh, separated from the Catholic Church. Right? But that's a separate story. I'm not really focusing on all of that today. Uh, I'm focusing on how it affected women. Uh, he, he left his first wife, Catherine, and Mary Anne Boleyn, uh, who was a chambermaid, uh, kind of high-class servant, if you like, working inside the court, and he, he had his eye on her for several years, 
but she was not one of those women who would just sleep with him, as many others did. Uh, she was determined it's marriage or nothing. And so he left his first wife and married her. Well, uh, she didn't give him a, a, a son, she gave him a daughter, so he chopped her head off. I'll say that again. She didn't give him a daughter, so he chopped her head off. Huh? Serious? Okay, it's serious. Uh, he said that she was sleeping with other men, but it's probably not true. I mean, she'd have to be crazy to sleep with other men with a husband like him. So if it was true, um, you know, it, it, she must have been really reckless. Uh, most historians consider that it wasn't true. So, um, the irony of it all is that, yes, he did finally, after his third marriage, he did finally have a son. But his son died young, and it was the two daughters who had a big influence, especially the, the, the second daughter, uh, Anne Boleyn's daughter, who became Queen Elizabeth. So these two uh, women went on to have a tremendous power in the 16th century. So it, we, we did have you know, things like Edward II's Isabella, uh, there were some powerful women during the Middle Ages, but the, seventh, the 16th century is kind of dominated, really, by powerful women at the top. Right? Uh, we've got uh, the first daughter, Catherine's uh, daughter, Mary, and then Elizabeth. We'll look at those in a little minute. Um, it, Elizabeth was the, the, the most powerful one because she... Uh, ruled for a very long time, about half of this, about half of uh, about fifty years. Okay, uh, half of the of the sixteenth um, century, the second half of the century, more or less. Uh, she was the queen, uh, and not only that, but during her lifetime, well, that was the period when England changed from being just a little a little country, you know off the edge of Europe that wasn't of any particular importance uh, and started along the path uh, that would lead it to be uh, the most powerful country in the world by the 18th century. Um, and the, the turning point probably was that she um, was, uh, during her time as a queen, uh, the, the, the uh, Spanish Armada, the um, famous fleet of ships, attacked England and somehow or other, they lost. England won. And Spain, uh, which had been maybe the most powerful country in Europe until then, after that steadily went down in its power and influence, and England steadily went up and became more and more powerful. And the other thing that she did was she set up the East India Company, which was, uh, or she didn't set it up, during her lifetime the East India Company was set up, uh, and that would later spearhead the, the British Empire in the East. So uh, it's her lifetime that saw the kind of transformation of the country. So a hugely powerful and uh, important woman from those days. Uh, Mary's, uh, sorry, Henry's sister had married uh, the King of Scotland. And that again uh, went on to play an important part not only in Scottish history, but in English history, because uh, going on down the line, uh, you'll notice that, that James IV, his, his uh, Miorgi, his family name is Stuart, and later on the Stuarts become kings of England as well. And this is basically because of this marriage. And so what brings Scotland together with England is the marriage of Henry's sister to uh, the, the Scottish king. In the end, that leads to the two countries joining together. Uh, Margaret was the grandmother of Mary, Queen of Scots. Be careful, we've got two Marys here. We've got Mary Stuart, Mary Queen of Scots. All right, she's a Stuart. Uh, I'm not sure if I put the name Stuart up here, but she's a Stuart. So let, let me put it on the board for you. She's a Stuart. Uh, we've got Mary Stuart who is the uh, 
the granddaughter of Henry's sister, and uh, she's usually called Mary, Queen of Scots, and we've got Mary Tudor, who is uh, the sister of Elizabeth. She's the first child of Henry, the first legitimate child of Henry, uh, the daughter of his first wife, Catherine. So we've got these two uh, important women also on the scene. Catherine of Aragon, the first wife. Well, she was one of the most educated and intelligent women in the whole of Europe. She was a Spanish princess, and Henry married her, uh, as, it, as I said, after his brother died. She was diplomatically strong, she was the first female ambassador ever in Europe. At the beginning of the 16th century, Europe had never had a woman who was uh, you know, doing that kind of work. But she was employed doing that kind of work because she was gifted. She had a talent, an ability to uh, communicate and negotiate. And uh, she played a, an important part in the, the, what we call humanism, Humanism was the move away from strict religion by itself into a kind of philosophy of human life. Right, so if you're, again, if you're interested in the broader background of this period, you, you probably want to take a look at the idea of humanism and what it was. Uh, she played quite an important part in the development of humanism. Um, through her contacts, particularly Erasmus, Thomas More, and... Uh, Juan Luis Vives. Uh, these were uh, important humanists of the early 16th century. These were philosophers um, who were developing this uh, idea of Christian humanism, um, softening, as it were, the kind of Christian religion and developing it, developing it more into a kind of philosophy. Um, and also, these people were important in their attitude towards women. Okay, uh, Gilles, for example, wrote the first book ever on women's education, on the institution of a, a Christian woman. Okay, uh, he wrote about women's education, as he says in the preface. He says nobody's ever written about this, and he's right. Right, and he dedicates it to. Catherine. Thomas More, uh, his, his daughters famously received a classical education on the same level as, as a man would. Uh, okay, it was unusual, it was un exceptional, but it was, it was beginning to happen right back there in the early 16th century that women were getting an education, that some women were getting an education that was as good as any education that any man ever got. And uh, Catherine would be and so would her children. Her, daughters, her daughter Mary was educated by uh, Vives and, uh, as I say, uh, his book was the first treatise ever published on the education of women. And uh, uh, her mother was a Catholic. Uh, she was brought up as a Catholic. She stayed a Catholic. When she became queen, uh, she used her power in a, a, a violent way to punish Protestants, and hundreds of Protestants were burned at that time. She cast a big shadow over the 16th century, all right, because of her burning of Protestants. I'm not going to hold it up as a positive example of women using their power, um, but it certainly is a powerful uh, position, um, and it's, it's, it, it has a powerful effect on the uh, understanding that people had of uh, that period, and also of, of women. It, 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 it affected the way that um, the society saw women, the fact that this happened. 
So uh, it's quite a, um, a significant aspect of, of the period. But uh, yeah, the, 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 the big influence that really affects the whole century, no, the second half of the century, is Elizabeth. Because Mary, uh, that's Queen Mary, Mary, Mary Tudor, also sometimes known as Bloody Mary because of this burning of Protestants, did not live for very long. And uh, after she died, uh, her sister Elizabeth, about whom you may notice something, uh, her sister uh, Elizabeth uh, took the throne and uh, she would be the, the, the really central female uh, character of the 16th century. By the time she was 12, she was recognized as one of the most intelligent women in the whole of Europe. And uh, very, uh, very, very highly educated. Um, Mary, her sister, had Catholic educators. Uh, Elizabeth had Protestant educators. Her mother was a Protestant. Hello. But, uh, yes, so uh, Roger Ascham uh, was uh, one of her tutors. And uh, she was just um, 11 years old when she translated the work of a French woman, a woman writer, again, a French woman, uh, Marguerite of Navarre, The Mirror of the Sinful Soul, or The Glass of the Sinful Soul. When she was 11 years old, she uh, presented a copy of it to Catherine Parr, who was the last wife, the sixth wife of Henry VIII. Uh, she is supposed to have embroidered the cover herself. At the age of 11, she was doing this kind of needlework. Uh, if you look inside the book, this is her handwriting. Um, okay. She, 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 she's written this inside the book. Uh, it, was a, it was a manuscript book. Okay? She, she wrote it by hand and she uh, presented it to her, um, her stepmother, her father's uh, wife. And she, was, she, she translated from the French, but she also spoke Dutch, you know, Flemish, uh, Spanish, Italian, Greek, Latin. And also the, the, the Celtic languages of Britain, the uh, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, Cornish, she spoke these languages as well. So she was uh, incredibly gifted in languages. She was um, in, intelligent, uh, highly educated, and able to rule England for most, most of 50 years. Here she is, and uh, if you take a look at that, you can see that she's surrounded, isn't she, by men. She's the queen, but uh, everybody around her is a man. So she's kind of uh, an exception to the norms. All right, if you just look all the way through there, okay, man, rows and rows and rows of them, all right, under her command. Well, all right, that gives us a kind of um, picture of a, a powerful woman who seems, but, but you can sort of say, yeah, she's, she's not... She's an exception. Most women are not like that. She's unique, isn't she? 
Well, well, yes, she is, but, but then, you know, remember what we said, that before her, there was another queen, Mary, right, the one who earned all the Protestants, and Mary herself had taken the throne from another woman, Lady Jane Grey, the, the, the poor woman who was called the nine-day queen, she didn't want to be queen, um, they put her forward as queen, and then Mary came and took, took her position, and chopped her head off, poor kid. Uh, so poor Lady Jane Grey, uh, you know, lost her life in a, in a power struggle that she never herself wanted. And then um, Elizabeth's main challenger for the throne was her cousin. Remember, her, her fa father's sister's granddaughter. All right? So cousin once removed um, by generation. So uh, Mary, uh, Queen of Scots. So you've got these... Not just one here, but, but four powerful women dominating the uh, 16th century political landscape. Which had a, a big influence on the kind of psychology of the 16th century. And also it, its shadow extends into the 17th century. The, the, this idea that women did this, women could do this, women were in these positions. And they had that kind of and it, it, it did influence um, thinking all the way through, uh, not just the 16th century, but the 17th century as well. So Lady Jane Grey, there she is, the Night Day Queen. Okay, uh, Mary Tudor, so-called Bloody Mary. Elizabeth, and then uh, her Scottish cousin, who was the champion of the Catholics. You see, uh, the Catholics wanted a Catholic queen, and so they wanted Mary, Queen of Scots, to be the Queen of England. Um, so she was a challenger to Elizabeth for many years. In the end, Elizabeth chopped her, head, her head chopped off because she found proof that Mary was plotting to kill her. And that's what led to the Spanish Armada, and so on. But this is the bigger historical picture. I, I, I'm going to too much detail with all of that because there's just so much to say. If you're interested in the period, please follow up these kinds of um, aspects. So we've got uh, these very powerful women in the 16th century. So it looks as if we've got a basically patriarchal society with just a few strong women at the top. Um, but again, you know, that's an oversimplification. It, it's, it, it, there's, there is a bit more to it than that. We, we've seen uh, women like Marjorie Kemp running a business you know, um, as a married woman. And uh, that continued in the uh, 16th century. You got women working, particularly textile, okay, clothing. That was one of the areas that women would uh, very often be involved with. Of course, most of the uh, businessmen were men, but there were businesswomen, there were a few. It's, it's not like there weren't any. Uh, you got Thomasine Bonaventure, okay, at the beginning of the 16th century. Uh, very often this sort of thing would happen through marriage. She married, so she, I can't remember exactly how many men she married, she, now, she married so this, Two or, th two or three at least. Uh, she, she, each marriage kind of consolidated her business position, and she, because when the, when her husband died, she was she inherited uh, her husband's uh, business. Um, so she she um, uh, was uh, an influential trader in textiles. And uh, then we got Denise Bodley, another example in died around the middle of the century, um, and she, again, she took over her husband's business after he died, and uh, another, uh, from later on in the century, Juliana Arthur, she was a major businesswoman, she, she ran a textile company, she, she was a money lender as well, uh, so there were women who were, you know, not just, I'm not just talking about the kings and, you know, the, the, the kings and queens, the sort of, that level of society, uh, there were other women in society who were occupying some uh, fairly important positions. 
the printing trade was another one where uh, women might expect to play a fairly large part. Again, very often um, because their, their uh, relationship with their husbands, either they worked together with their husband or the, the husband would die leaving them with um, a, a, a big sort of uh, inheritance uh, in terms of having inherited the company, the printing company, which they then carried on by themselves. So there's se several major women printers from the 16th century. And uh, just before I finish this section, we mustn't forget another very important group of women from this time, the... Um, sorry, I forgot that I put that in there. That's, that's, uh, if you want to follow this up, take a look at... Uh, it's an online source, uh, a who's who of Tudor women, all right? Um, it, it, it really kind of gives you, an, it gives you a list of all of them and it gives some details about them. It's a very nicely put together little website. She's not an academic, but she's done a very nice job there. Uh, and she's got all of the uh, important uh, business women and the influential women of that period. And so, yes, finally then, I'd just like to uh, talk about the, um, the martyrs. Uh, we've seen, we've seen um, Mary as you know, the burner, the person who did the burning of the Protestants, but the women uh, who were victims were also uh, very, very, had a very powerful psychological influence on the society uh, at that time and carrying on into the 17th century. Those women, their bravery was held up as an example to men. You know, if they could suffer like that, then why are you complaining? Nobody's burning you to death. Okay, so, so um, the, that, that would be another uh, aspect of uh, women uh, gaining power in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in an unusual way, in a way, because they, were, they, 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 they sacrificed their lives. But they were held up as an example of bravery. They were held up as an example of uh, women who controlled their destiny. Uh, for them, it was more important to go to heaven than, than to suffer pain on this world, in this world. You know? uh, so uh, that would be another very important aspect of women uh, who, uh, through their bravery in facing uh, martyrdom, gained uh, an influence on the society. So again, uh, I'll take a short break at this point. All right, the actual literature, the actual writing. Well, um, in terms of published work, Marjorie Kemp's work was published during the uh, 16th century. As we said, she was writing earlier than that, of course. She was from the mid late Middle Ages. But her works were published, a, a, a couple of her works. Um, and uh, Catherine Parr, Henry VIII's last mm -hmm. wife, uh, she wrote... Um, some prayers and um, something called the Lamentation of a Sinner. Uh, these were um, original works, but most of the writing that came from women's pens at that time was actually translated. It wasn't original. Uh, for some reason, women were considered suitable to translate, but not to not so much to write original works. This will be in the first half of the 16th century. And so um, you've got one or two exceptions, but you've got quite a, uh, a, a sort of, um, s sort of a number of translated works. Um, Mary Tudor, that's uh, Queen Mary the Bloody, the one we're calling Bloody Mary, she translated some Catholic works. Uh, so did um, uh, a high-class lady called Margaret Beaufort. Um, Margaret Moore um, and, and the Queen Elizabeth and Anne Askew, Anne Bacon, Elizabeth Fane, uh, they, they were translating uh, mostly Protestant works. So as you can see, uh, even when it came to translation, it would be religious. All right, so that the writings would be, um, the original writings were religious in nature, and the translations were also uh, mainly 
religious. Uh, during the, that, that, that's what I'm looking at here is the first half of the 16th century. Um, and uh, yeah, they were all religious works. As you move on through the century, um, you get um, Anne Bacon. She continued to, to, to translate religious works. Anne Douglas. Um, Mary Sidney Herbert is the name that's going to stand out here because she's the most famous. She was actually compared with Shakespeare at one point. Um, and she also translated a, a non-religious work, um, a, a tragedy by um, uh, Garnier, and uh, so did Margaret Tyler. A few years earlier, she had translated a Spanish work called Pinier de Calahorras, uh, Mirror of Princely Deeds. So um, we were beginning to get women uh, translating works that were not uh, religious. But the, the bulk of uh, women's writing and translation was uh, religious in nature. And then um, you start to get, also during the second half of the 16th century, you're starting to get actual original writing by women uh, coming uh, into print. Uh, so, um, Lady Jane Grey, the Nine Day Prince, uh, wrote some very moving prayers, particularly uh, you know, because of the fact that she was going to meet her death. She wrote prayers about that. Um, Catherine Knollys, Elizabeth Tyrrell. Uh, most of these names are not particularly famous today. Of course, Elizabeth Tudor, the Queen. Um, but uh, well, these would mostly be uh, the, the, the main genre of the time was poetry. Right? So these would mostly be poems of a non-religious nature. So uh, you're beginning to get women writing uh, about other topics apart from uh, religion. Uh, so that you get uh, a book of poetry by uh, Jane Seymour and her sisters, um, Lady Jane Seymour, um, right at the beginning of the uh, 16th century. You get um, Writings by Lady Jane Grey, again the, 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 the poor woman, young, young woman who was the nine day queen and was put to death by Mary. Uh, Elizabeth herself, again, she wrote not all her writings were religious. Um, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, all right. Uh, but as it, once again, it's that name out of that list that we've got there Anne Cecil, Countess of Oxford, uh, Jane Anger. Uh, is it worthy of mention? It's not really, no, we don't know anything about her, but I'll come back to her in a minute. Um, except for what she wrote, we don't know anything about her, who she was. Mary Sidney Herbert, uh, the Countess of Pembroke, who is the, 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 the outstanding woman who was writing uh, in the 16th century, the famous one, the really famous one. And uh, all these other names are kind of uh, less. Uh, less uh, well known. So uh, those two, Mary Sidney Herbert and Jane Anger, certainly worth taking a, a closer look at. So uh, yeah, Mary Sidney Herbert is really the most significant writer, female writer of her day. Here she is. And uh, she was the sister of uh, a very, very famous writer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All <laughs> right. Um, yeah, she's the she's the, the, the one that we would uh, mostly remember today. Uh, she was she had an outstanding reputation um, and was cited by. The anthologist uh, John Bodenham as being one of the great writers of her day. Uh, and that's alongside her brother Philip Sidney and Edmund Spencer and Shakespeare. So uh, she was very close to her brother and that's something that we're going to look at uh, at the end of the class. <laughs>
And the Sydney Psalms, which were a translation of the Psalms of the Bible, are uh, perhaps some of the most beautiful poetry of the 16th century. And uh, she and her brother worked together. And this is one of the problems with her authorship of material. How much did she write? How much did her brother write? It's kind of um, not, not very clear. Uh, and uh, even so, we do know that she played a fairly important part in the Sydney Psalms, and uh, especially the later ones, were probably almost entirely done by her. And the, um, the famous poet uh, John Donne uh, also praised her translation. Uh, it, it was a translation set to verse, you see, so it wasn't just a translation, it was a tremendous amount of imagination needed there. And then we've got her poem, uh, which we're going to look at uh, in class, if we've got a few minutes at the end here today, uh, The Doleful Lay of Florinda, where she laments about, well, actually, the poem is a lament on the death of her brother, who died in war a few years previously. And uh, so, well, the poem was published a few years after what she's dead. Uh, so uh, she's saying that uh, it's no good telling your sorrows to the gods because the gods already know about uh, uh, human suffering. So you know, we tell them, they say, well, we know. In fact, we cause it to happen. We make you suffer. So why go to the gods for, when you're grieving? Uh, and then uh, why, why tell other men? Because, because they're also the victims and they suffer as well. But what should you do when you're feeling grief? What should you do when, you, when you're feeling uh, sadness and, uh, and suffering. And her conclusion is, well, uh, to myself I will my sorrow mourn, sit none alive like sorrowful remains, and to myself my plaints shall back return to pay their usury with double pains. The woods, the hills, the rivers shall resound the mournful accent of my sorrow's ground. I'll, I'll go out into the countryside and I'll just cry by myself because there's nobody who will really understand me or uh, experience my suffering or who can, ha can help me. Well, powerful as, uh, as that is, the most extraordinary piece of women's writing from this time is probably uh, Jane Anger's uh, Protection for Women, which is possibly, I mean, people talk about, you know, where does feminism begin? Most people are sort of saying, oh, you know, it starts in the 19th century, uh, oh, there's Mary Wollstonecraft in the late 18th century, and they push it a little back, bit back into the late 18th century. But really, Mary Wollstonecraft, as we shall see, is not really saying anything very different from things that people were saying 100 years before her. And here's something like 200 years before Mary Wollstonecraft, and look at what this uh, early modern woman is saying. All right? Uh, fie on the falsehood of men whose minds go oft a madding and whose tongues cannot so soon be wagging but straight they fall a railing. Was there ever any so abused, so slandered, so railed upon or so wickedly handled undeservedly as are we women? There you go. I mean, that's, that's, that's got to be a feminist statement, hasn't it? Okay? And it's right back there, you know, two, more than 200 years before uh, most people start thinking about, you know, the, the roots and origins of feminism. But of course, I mean, we could go back and look at things from the ancient Greeks and Romans. Women have not been silent through history. Women have spoken up. Uh, but uh, in, in English uh, prose, uh, this would be a, a sort of uh, starting point. I don't think we'll find anything very much before uh, Jane Anger's Protection for Women. So it's a proto-feminist writing. Uh, and as I say, we could go back to the ancient Greeks and find such writings, but in, for, for, from our point of view, in terms of English literature, uh, her attack on male prejudice, her criticism of uh, male authority is pretty unique. It's a pretty decisive development, and uh, the use of printed word by women to assert their rights and to uh, talk about their moral outrage can, can be traced back as far as the, uh, the late 16th 
century here. And now that's what I'm going to finish for today. Sorry, yes, just make a final comment that uh, if, you, uh, if you would like more details on early modern writers, then another uh, text that you can get, you can get this online, it's available online. Uh, if you just Google up uh, Ruth Willard Huey's work on cultural interests of women in England from 1524 to 1640, uh, it's, it's an old piece of writing, it goes back to the 1930s, but it's a pretty good starting point. Uh, she really has kind of brought together all the, the major authors from that period. So uh, I would recommend that as your kind of uh, research text if you want to get started in that bucket. Okay, and so this time I really am finishing. Um, that's the end of uh, today's presentation.